The Bilderberg Group has released its full participant list and agenda for the 2015 Elitist Confab days before it's set to begin in Austria. But as ever, the topics up for discussion are so vague as to almost be meaningless. And we know that many of the most sensitive topics never appear on the list in the first place. So what's the real agenda of Bilderberg 2015? For a start, it's unusual that Bilderberg is taking place after the G7 conference. It's normally the other way around. This suggests that Bilderberg's role in not only setting the consensus, but making the final call on many of these issues will be pivotal this year. The intense security surrounding the Interalpen Hotel, with our reporters Rob Dew and Josh Owens already having been harassed numerous times by police, illustrates how paranoid Bilderberg are about keeping the details of their agenda under wraps. Artificial intelligence will be one of the core discussion topics at Bilderberg 2015, and one of the most interesting newbies in terms of Bilderberg attendees is undoubtedly Regina Duggan, former DARPA director and now Google executive, and a pioneer of ingestible ID microchips. Duggan, along with Google chairman Eric Schmidt and Demis Hassabis, vice president of engineering for Google DeepMind, will scheme with global power brokers on how to grease the skids for public acceptance and adoption of big brother technology that otherwise wouldn't look out of place in a dystopian sci-fi thriller. This all ties into Bilderberg's overarching goal of rebranding authoritarianism. As a result of endless money printing and growing wealth inequality, the global elite has created the preconditions for widespread riots and civil unrest. We already had a taste of this with Ferguson and Baltimore. Now the wealthy are buying safe rooms and secret hideaways in remote locations as they prepare to hunker down for the next stage of the economic collapse. And Bloomberg is now reporting that Johann Rupert, the billionaire owner of Cartier, is worried about artificial intelligence and robots replacing human workers, causing class warfare and social disorder. Make no mistake, Bilderberg wants class warfare. They want riots, because this allows the elite to exploit the chaos, pose as the saviours, and introduce the solution of statist and economic totalitarianism. And if you want to get a true insight into what motivates Bilderberg, look no further than the guy who calls the shots, Henry Kissinger. All the other Bilderberg attendees, bar David Rockefeller, show deference to the National Security Advisor. Kissinger has always been an aggressive advocate of real politic, an amoral Machiavellian form of diplomacy and policymaking which eschews morality and ethical considerations. And of course, Kissinger has been implicated in numerous war crimes, crimes against humanity, kidnap, torture, and murder in places like Chile, Cambodia, and East Timor. But what's most alarming is the fact that the 92-year-old Kissinger still advises the Obama administration today. He's been lobbying for years for regime change in Syria, which may at some stage be achieved as a result of ISIS, created partly as a result of the US arming other jihadist groups in the region, taking over half the country, something the Syrian rebels could never accomplish. Under the guise of stopping terror financing to ISIS, which only seems to have become stronger since the US and others began officially targeting the terror organization, Bilderberg will discuss imposing harsher bank restrictions, eviscerating whatever financial privacy we have left, as well as a coordinated EU crackdown on the sale of precious metals. This ties in to the wider war on cash. Numerous voices have recently called for eliminating physical currency altogether, giving central banks and governments the power to directly control your finances under the justification of preventing an economic collapse. At its most authoritarian extreme, this means having to obtain government permission every time you withdraw or spend a moderately large sum of money. France is already set to introduce laws in September, which will restrict French citizens from making cash payments over 1,000 euros. Bilderberg is set to intensify 
this crackdown on cash. Preventing Greece from ditching the euro and stacking the deck against the EU referendum outvote in the United Kingdom will also be a core centerpiece of Bilderberg's agenda going forward over the next 12 months. The EU and the single currency is a pet project of Bilderberg. If that pillar of world government begins to crumble, it undermines the rest of the architecture of global government, including TPP, which again, despite not being on the official list, will be discussed by Bilderberg members. A top member of the jihadist group that the US government and NATO armed and funded in the overthrow of Colonel Gaddafi back in 2011 is now leading ISIS forces in Libya. Once again, the growth of ISIS can be traced directly back to our government's insane policy of aiding terrorists who went on to join ISIS after the destabilization of the secular governments in Libya and Syria. Abdel Hakim Belhaj, seen here meeting with Senators John McCain and Lindsey Graham, was the Emir of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, LIFG, an organization affiliated with Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, which killed US troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. In 2011, I wrote a series of articles pointing out that the US and Britain were directly supporting jihadists like Belhaj in an area in Libya which West Point warned was the world capital for Al-Qaeda suicide bomber recruitment. We were supporting these people to overthrow Gaddafi when Tripoli fell with the aid of British and American cruise missiles. These same terrorists got access to nuclear material, deadly chemicals and 30,000 shoulder-fired rockets. After being handed power, these same terrorists flew the Al-Qaeda flag over courthouses in Benghazi, the same flag now being flown by ISIS militants. They imposed Sharia law, while transforming Libya from a relatively prosperous and thriving nation into a brutal hellhole run by tribal warlords and jihadists. And our governments helped them do it. Some of these same terrorists were then airlifted into Syria by our allies to join the ranks of jihadist rebels and the effort to topple the Assad government, which of course led to the birth of ISIS in the region. And even as the US continues to support so-called moderate rebels in Syria, thousands of them are defecting to the Islamic State. The Citizens Committee on Benghazi report concluded that the United States was involved in, quote, knowingly facilitating the provision of weapons to known Al-Qaeda militias and figures, including Bel Hajj, and that if the US, quote, hadn't been helping to arm Al-Qaeda militias throughout Libya, the attack on the US consulate wouldn't have occurred a year later. The White House armed, funded, militarily aided, and gave political office to the guy now leading ISIS terrorists in Libya. So we keep hearing this line in the media over and over again. How do we stop ISIS? Do we need to send in ground troops? How about this? How about you stop arming and funding fucking bloodthirsty terrorists in the first place? How's that for a novel idea? How about you stop destabilizing secular governments and replacing them with gangs of jihadist lunatics? How about we find out why the hell ISIS keeps receiving these accidental airdrops of weapons caches from British and American planes. ISIS is now threatening to send half a million immigrants from Libya to cause chaos on the streets of Europe. The Islamic State continues to butcher Christians and Muslims across the region. And all because our governments supported these subhuman scumbags from the very beginning. If Donald Trump threatened to go to war with a major military power, do you think the media would be interested? Yet Hillary Clinton just did precisely that, and it's barely a footnote in the mainstream press. Take a look. You've seen reports. Russia's hacked into a lot of things. China's hacked into a lot of things. Russia even hacked into the Democratic National Committee. Maybe even some state election systems. So we've got to step up our game, make sure we are well defended and able to take the fight to those who go after us. As president, I will make it clear that the United States will treat cyber attacks just like any other attack. 
we will be ready with serious political, economic, and military responses. In case you missed that, Hillary just said that the next time Russia is blamed for a hack, because there's no evidence whatsoever that they were behind the DNC hack, Hillary will fight them with a military response. Fighting with a military response. That sounds a heck of a lot like a threat of war to me. Threatening to declare war on Russia. You'd think that would be a big story, right? Yet virtually no big media outlet even highlighted it. Donald Trump has been savaged for being reckless with his words. Yet here we have Hillary openly invoking military conflict with a global superpower, and the media gives her a free pass. We've had a year of hysteria over Trump starting World War III and having control over the nuclear codes. But it's not Trump who's brazenly threatening another nuclear-armed country with war. It's Hillary Clinton. Clinton is crazy. She thinks Vladimir Putin is behind literally everything, from WikiLeaks email hacks to Trump to the rise of the alt-right, with zero evidence. But the media parrots it like it's gospel. She's also perfectly prepared to launch into wars that have disastrous consequences. We came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> and I want the Iranians to know that if I'm the president, we will attack Iran. We would be able to totally obliterate them. Hillary Clinton openly threatening war with Russia, and the media doesn't even report on it. But they'll continue to lecture us about how it's Trump who's being irresponsible with his rhetoric. Give me a break. While the media distracted you with an 11-year-old tape of Donald Trump's locker room banter, WikiLeaks dropped bombshell after bombshell, and the Clinton mouthpiece media have barely even reported on it. In one email sent by Hillary surrogate Bill Ivey to Clinton campaign manager John Podesta, Ivey brags about how the left has sought to maintain political power by producing, quote, an unaware and compliant citizenry. This is beyond arrogant elitism. It sounds like something out of they live. The gains have been substantial, both for ourselves and for you, the human power elite. <laughs> We've all been quite content to demean government drop civics and in general conspire to produce an unaware and compliant citizenry. Conspire conspire to produce an uninformed mass who will just do as they're told. The unawareness remains strong, but compliance is obviously fading rapidly. This problem demands some serious, serious thinking, and not just poll-driven, demographically inspired messaging. To emphasize, Ivy admits that the left has conspired to produce an unaware and compliant citizenry, but that they're not as easy to manipulate anymore and that this is a problem. He characterizes unawareness amongst the public as a positive thing for the Clinton campaign. So we're supposed to be outraged about Trump's locker room banter from 2005. Yet here we have a Clinton surrogate calling the entire population of America dumb and conspiring with the Clinton campaign to keep it that way. And there's no outrage whatsoever. There's not even any media coverage of it. Absolutely nothing. But are you really surprised, given what the other WikiLeaks emails reveal, about the level of collusion between the cocked media and Team Hillary? They talk about their friendlies in the media who will blithely regurgitate their talking points. Reporters like CNBC's John Harwood emailing the Clinton campaign, begging to be patted on the head like an obedient dog for lavishing praise on Hillary. The New York Times asking the Clinton campaign for permission to use quotes from their own interview with Hillary. The Boston Globe colluding with her campaign to give her quote a big presence. This level of cronyism and corruption is staggering, but it explains why much of the media refuses to even cover the WikiLeaks releases. Things like Hillary openly admitting that our so-called allies, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, are funding and supporting ISIS. Oh, but Trump said the word posse in 2005, so I guess that's more important. Confirmation that Hillary deliberately and criminally deleted certain emails to hide evidence of her wrongdoing. Moles inside Bernie Sanders' campaign who betrayed his strategy to tip off Hillary. Bill Clinton's behavior pushing a female Clinton Foundation staffer to near suicide. Insiders within Hillary's campaign petrified about the damage posed by Bill Clinton's sexual predator 
mandatory past. Oh, but you didn't hear about any of this on CNN. But you did hear Donald Trump say the word pussy in 2005, and to the media, that's what matters. And they wonder why their readership is collapsing. They wonder why 94% of the American people no longer trust a thing, they say. Dear mainstream media, why do you still insult our intelligence by claiming to be impartial when the WikiLeaks email dump has exposed the fact that you're pretty much a public relations firm for Hillary Clinton? You're not journalists, you're prostitutes. You're fucking sellout hacks who thought you wouldn't get caught prostrating yourselves for Team Hillary. Well, you have been caught, and it's fucking sickening. Handing questions to Hillary 24 hours before a town hall debate. Giving Hillary's campaign staff veto power over your articles. Lavishing her with praise and saying the story you're writing about her is the one that she wants. Scheming with Team Hillary to write op-eds that would give her a quote, big presence. Allowing Hillary's campaign to play stories with you as they literally describe you as friendlies, teeing up stories to benefit Hillary, going to John Podesta's house for cosy dinners, being cherished by Hillary like you're her secret crush. Never Trumpers. Was it really worth trashing your entire careers and shitting on your audience just so you could pretend to be part of the establishment. Louise Mensch, a self-proclaimed conservative, exposed as a Hillary sycophant, writing emails begging to write campaign ads for her. My average retweets per tweet, 1896. Louise Mensch's average retweets per tweet, four. <laughs> No one resonates with your bullshit. I mean, at least Politico's Glenn Thrush had the honesty to admit that he was a hack. When are the rest of you going to come clean and admit that you're taking it up the ass from Hillary, Podesta, and the rest of the Democratic Party establishment on a daily basis? Journalist donations, $382,000 to Hillary. Only $14,000 to Trump. There's no media bias, though. Yeah, right. Do you mainstream media? Why is Donald Trump a crazy, dangerous conspiracy theorist for talking about a rigged system? Donald Trump's biggest lie is about the election itself, the integrity of the election. He is alleging a massive conspiracy. The system, folks, is rigged. Of course the elections will not be rigged. What does that mean? But when Democrats talk about a rigged system, they're paragons of wisdom. A sense of a rigged system. The game is rigged against them. So there's a sense the game is rigged. Yes, this is what a rigged economy is about. A rigged system. They'll do anything to rig the system for most of the time. The game is rigged. How can you claim that vote fraud is not a thing while top Democratic Party operatives are on tape bragging about how they carry out vote fraud? But this is no, absolutely, absolutely. You know what? We've been busting people in to be fucking asshole for 50 years, and we're not going to stop now. If nothing is rigged, why did your moderators interrupt Trump way more times than Clinton during the debates? And, and why did it morph into excuse that? Me, no, did me. you? No, answer the question. Why do you, you still believe? You I do. Me all the time. Why don't you Would interrupt you please? her? And even insert themselves into the debates. There are sometimes reasons the military does that. I, Psychological I can't warfare. Think of any. I can't think of any. It and might be to it. help we get General civilians Flynn, out. And we, I'd like to know, Anderson, why aren't you bringing up the emails? I'd like to know. It's nice to one on three. If nothing is rigged, why do you need to rig post-debate polls by sampling more Democrats than Republicans every time to ensure Hillary wins? If nothing is rigged, then why does your satellite feed mysteriously drop every time someone is about to say something negative about Hillary Clinton. Two thirds or more of the public knows that Hillary Clinton's a liar. She can't be trusted. And now the two faces of Hillary Clinton are coming out. The fact through WikiLeaks that she says one thing. Uh, and oh no. It was Hillary Clinton that she should get an award from them as the founder of ISIS. That's what it because of her support in the 1990s for anti-crime legislation that ultimately helped contribute to this era of mass incarceration that she now uh, speaks out uh, again. Uh -oh. uh, we just lost, uh, we just lost Brianna Keeler. Dear mainstream media, why did you spin the narrative all year that it was Trump supporters who were to blame for violence at Trump rallies? If you want to know what led up to Chicago tonight, 
That was Donald Trump's display of leadership. Candidate Donald Trump's rhetoric has escalated it. When it was clearly Democratic Party hired agitators who were responsible. So the Chicago protest, when they shut all that, that was us. Conflict engagement in, in the lines at Trump rallies. We need to start this shit right away. We have mentally ill people. Mm. We pay to do shit. Make no mistake. The whole point okay. of it is we know that Trump's people will, will freak the fuck out. The security team will freak out, and his supporters will lose their shit. Foval and his people train the agitators to go to Trump rallies. Which means we have to have a central kind of agitator training. Yep. We are contracted directly with the DNC and the campaign. What we don't need is for it to show up on CNN that the DNC paid for X people to... That's not going to happen. Ultimately, the whole endeavor is to get negative press of Trump and his supporters in local and national media. Dear mainstream media, why are you closing down comment sections on your website? And they claim it's, oh, it's trolling. It's abuse and harassment. No, it's fucking not. It's because everybody hates you and you lie. Why have you spent the last two weeks obsessing over words that Trump said 11 years ago while affording virtually zero attention to bombshell WikiLeaks revelations about Hillary Clinton's actions? Not her words, her actions. Actions that impact everyday working Americans right here, right now. While suggesting that it's illegal for the public to even read WikiLeaks emails and that anything we learn from them must be through you. It's illegal to possess. Uh, these stolen documents. It's different for the media. So everything you learn about this, you're learning from us. Dear mainstream media, how can you have the temerity to constantly demonize us as conspiracy theorists? This crap about her supposed health and all this stuff that's been made up that's plainly wrong. He peddles uh, these conspiracy theories. It's very troubling. Conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories. When you routinely peddle the most grotesque, damaging, and misleading conspiracy theories imaginable. Oh, you know, like that one about Saddam Hussein having weapons of mass destruction. A conspiracy theory that led to the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of people and the rise of ISIS. Exactly as I predicted five months ago, the political class, the establishment, and the media are doing everything imaginable to sabotage Brexit. So they had a by-election in Richmond, an area in London that voted 70% to remain in the EU, and imagine my shock, the pro-Remain candidate won. First off, when are we having a second by-election? I mean, that's how you want it, right? Just keep making everyone vote again and again until you get the result you want. But then the media came out and hailed it as a stunning reversal of Brexit sentiment across the entire country. Right, so 20,000 posh twats in Richmond represents the country better than 17.4 million Brexit voters. I don't think so. So you got 70% of the vote for Remain, but only 50% of the vote for the Remain candidate, Sarah Olney. Let me do the maths here. You lost 20% of the vote in an area that was already overwhelmingly pro-Remain. How on earth is that a repudiation of Brexit? Olney said that Brexit supporters were intolerant, backward-looking and divisive. A regurgitation of the narrative that anyone who voted for Leave is a racist bigot who just hates immigrants. Isn't it interesting that Olney and her supporters like to virtue signal about how tolerant and pro-diversity they are while choosing to live in the whitest area of London possible. Yeah, if you're so convinced about the wonderful cultural enrichment that mass immigration brings, why do you reside in the area with the least number of immigrants? Pretty racist, if you ask me. And while we're on the subject of intolerance, it's Vote Remain supporters who have been the most intolerant of Brexit voters. Disowning them, smearing them, publicly shaming them, attacking them in the street, wishing deadly illnesses upon their babies. Olney also said that she would, quote, vote to override the referendum result. So let me get this straight. Your party has the word Democrats in its name, yet you're talking about overriding the democratic will of the British people. Yeah, that's not very democratic. Olney had to be dragged off the air by her spin doctor during a radio show because she made a complete tit out of herself proving she knew nothing about the EU. There was no clear manifesto for what happened to you know, our membership of the single market. Or what yes, there was. The Remain movement. campaign said we were going to leave the single market if we voted out. I'd, 
Yes, they did. They repeated it. Every single mem leading member of the Remain campaign said a vote to leave the EU was a vote to leave the single market. Nothing unclear about that at all. I am I'm really sorry, but Sarah only has to leave now. No, she doesn't. Sarah, if, you're not, if you want to be elected member of parliament, I think you should probably be able to answer some simple questions about your policy. Can you get Sarah back on the line, please? Sorry about that. We've waited an hour. Yeah, We've, I don't know who you are. We've waited an hour to have this interview. If she doesn't want to answer questions from a, a radio station, perhaps she's not fit to be an MP. And they had the temerity to call vote leave supporters low information. This all happened after a ruling by a bunch of corrupt Europhile High Court judges who said that when we all voted for the government to implement Brexit, it didn't really mean that we were voting for the government to implement Brexit. That's strange, because when I received this letter from the government before Brexit, it said the government will implement what you decide. It didn't say, your vote is worthless because we'll just keep having referendums until we get the result we want. It didn't say, your vote is worthless because a bunch of twattish celebrities, corrupt judges and lefty politicians will whine and bitch for months to try and subvert and sabotage a democratic result because they lost and they're butthurt about it. It didn't say, your vote is worthless because your own supposed representatives will demand a parliamentary vote and then vote against the democratic decision of their own constituents. It didn't say, your vote is worthless because we'll insert endless amendments to water it down to the point where it's unrecognisable from what you thought you were voting on in the first place. And now we're about to have another bunch of corrupt Europhile judges tell us once again that our vote meant nothing. Thing, while the media lectures us to not be mean to the corrupt Europhile judges. While Remain pressure groups celebrate the High Court ruling as a victory for parliamentary sovereignty. As they support the very entity, the EU, that has completely eviscerated parliamentary sovereignty. While Remain pressure groups literally call themselves the People's Challenge, while shitting all over the will of the people. While super wealthy elitists like Gina Miller swoop in to save the country from the baying Brexit mob. What part of the word leave don't you understand? Michael Moore is a sack of shit. I just heard on the streets of Belfast here that you supported Hillary Clinton. She voted for the Iraq war. Uh, she is funded by Goldman Sachs. This is not good. Now we have Hillary Clinton and you to blame for this. But you should be out there doing what you can do to get Hillary Clinton elected because the, every minute counts now. I mean, this is a pretty good person. She's a decent person. I believe that she has made incredible uh, changes that the left should embrace and, and we should get out there and get excited about her. <laughs> Wait a minute, you're telling me that Michael Moore, the guy who built his entire career on railing against Wall Street and corporate America, is now endorsing Hillary Clinton, the ultimate bought and paid for corporate stooge Wall Street insider. The woman whose campaign has received over $58 million from big banks and Wall Street firms. It took Michael Moore just four months to go from this... Now we have Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and you to blame for this. This is not good. To this. I mean, this is a pretty good person. She's a decent person. What happened to Michael Moore? Whether you love or loathe his politics, Michael Moore's entire shtick for the past 25 years has been to cultivate this champion of the average Joe image. Now he's endorsing someone who literally tells elitists in private speeches that it's important to have a public and a private policy. In other words, it's important to lie to the average Joe. Michael Moore's first film, Roger and Me, the one that made him famous is about how Flint, Michigan was devastated when all the jobs started being offshored thanks to globalist trade policies. Globalist trade policies that Hillary Clinton supported, that she continued to support with NAFTA, that she continued to support with TPP. Critics blame NAFTA for the loss of manufacturing jobs in industrial states including Ohio and Pennsylvania. Hillary Clinton helped get NAFTA approved. She held at least five meetings to strategize about how to win congressional approval. She helped the White House block opposition from labor and environmental groups, and she was the featured speaker at a crucial meeting, participants in that event said, quote, her remarks were totally pro-NAFTA. So Michael Moore, the man who cut his teeth on standing up to doctrines of neoliberal globalization, is now endorsing the ultimate embodiment 
of neoliberal globalization, Hillary Clinton. But wait, that's not all. Michael Moore's next big film, Canadian Bacon, was a satirical denunciation of the ludicrousness of war. It's time to give war a chance. Dead, dead. What are we gonna do for an enemy now? Now he's endorsed a candidate who has ludicrously threatened to go to war with Russia. As president, I will make it clear that the United States will treat cyber attacks just like any other attack. We will be ready with serious political, economic, and military responses. And I'm not done. In Michael Moore's best-selling book, Downsize This, he crucified Nike for outsourcing shoe production and killing American jobs. Now he's endorsing a candidate whose Clinton Foundation received as much as $1 million from, you guessed it, Nike. Nike also supports the TPP, which will outsource more American jobs. The very thing that Michael Moore supposedly opposes. And I'm still not done. In Fahrenheit 9-11, Moore chastised the Bush family for their close ties to the Saudi government. The same Saudi government that gave $25 million to the Clinton Foundation. The Clinton Foundation. The clues in the name, Michael. That's your candidate. But don't worry because Michael Moore has come up with an ingenious explanation to justify his bizarre flip-flop. Why should people support Hillary Clinton, especially people like you who feel like they represent the Clintons themselves, including Hillary Clinton, they represent corporate interests and not the working man and woman? Because I don't think that's where she's at now. I think that she's going to go in there. I mean, first of all, she's adopted two-thirds of Bernie's platform. I don't understand any Bernie supporter who's still angry about this when the candidate has has adopted two-thirds of what he was pushing for. That's right, Hillary Clinton, who is deemed honest and trustworthy by just 11% of the US population. The woman who says it's important to deceive people by having a public and a private policy. But you can totally trust her when she says she's going to adopt the populist planks of Bernie's platform. Give me a break. It would be bad enough if Moore was abandoning his principles for a lesser of two evils scenario. But it's far worse. In his new film Trumpland, he's literally sitting in front of giant pictures of Hillary Clinton while calling her his forbidden love. He calls on the audience to stand up and perform emotional odes to Hillary, like they're worshipping dear leader. This wouldn't look out of place in North Korea. He also says Hillary is the new Pope Francis, literally deifying her. If we saw a North Korean comic do a routine that basically involved cajoling the audience to sing the praises of Kim Jong-un, we'd think, God, these poor people can't even chill at stand-up, writes Brendan O'Neill. Yet here we have one of America's best-known funny men turning a comedy show into a cultish cum therapeutic rally for the possible next commander-in-chief, and no one bats an eyelid. Here's another reason why Michael Moore is a sack of shit. You've probably seen that whole rant where he outlines why the middle class are supporting Trump. You know, that bit that Trump supporters turned into a campaign ad. Trump's election is going to be the biggest fuck you ever recorded in human history. Well, this is what you didn't see. And then, like the Brits, who wanted to send a message, so they voted to leave Europe, only to find out that if you vote to leave Europe, you actually have to leave Europe. And now they regret it. Total bullshit. Even after a massive sustained propaganda campaign, the polls show that only 6% of Brexit voters regretted it. Only 6%. Theresa May, the new Prime Minister who has promised to take Britain out of the EU, is also incredibly popular. Neither of those things are indicators of regret. They all voted to leave, and now they regret it, and over 4 million of them have signed a petition to have a do-over. They want another election. <sighs> the people who signed a petition to have a do-over were the ones who voted to remain in the EU not leave it, you utter fucking moron. So he's trying to argue that the Brexit vote was a terrible decision and that all the people who voted for it are now regretting it. And then he's equating that to Trump supporters. Even though every single example he cites of Brexit regret is disproven bullshit. How many more people do I need to convince? <laughs> An army of idiots is convinced that 2016 is the worst year ever 
Because Trump won and some celebrities died. David Bowie left us. George Michael left us. Carrie Fisher left us. Prince left us. We elected Donald fucking Trump. 2016, worst year ever. 2016, worst year ever. Don't take Carrie Fisher away from us, please. Take Trump instead. So, with all these celebrity deaths and a Cheeto Puff becoming president, <laughs> people are considering 2016 to be the worst year ever. I don't know if this is the worst year ever for celeb deaths, but it sure feels like it. Fuck you, 2016. Good riddance. It's official. 2016 has been the worst year ever and the highest year for celebrity deaths. 2017 better get here soon or I'm out. Hashtag 2016 sucks. 2017 is only a few days away. Thank God we can finally say goodbye to the worst year ever. Right, so because some random actors and musicians that you never met, knew, or really cared about before they died, died, and because some political outcomes didn't go your way, that makes 2016 the worst year ever! Get a grip. The 1918 Spanish flu pandemic killed 50 to 100 million people. 5% of the world's population. Yeah, that probably affected more people than Carrie Fisher passing away. The Soviet famine of 32 to 33 killed so many millions of people, we don't even know the actual number. But the alleged drug addict George Michael dies, and it's a global tragedy. Get some frigging perspective. On one day alone, in 1916, nearly 20,000 British soldiers were killed at the Battle of the Somme. On one day. That was an actual tragedy. Yes, it's sad for George Michael and Carrie Fisher's family that they died prematurely. But how does it affect you in any way? Most of the idiot millennials crying over this weren't even born when George Michael and Carrie Fisher were in their heyday. You've been manipulated by celebrity-obsessed culture to take it personally. The other reason is that we've allowed society and culture to become completely atomized. Celebrities of the 20th century were universally known and loved because being a celebrity was something that had to be earned. You might not believe this, but celebrities used to actually have talent to become famous. Now, fame is determined by who can be the most vulgar. Who can sell out quickly enough to become the poster child for the next generation of nihilistic, mindless, cultural parasites. The result is that there are more celebrities than ever before, with less some talent than ever before. So you're not really mourning the deaths of Prince and George Michael. You're mourning the death of your culture. The death of authenticity. Will anyone mourn the deaths of these idiots in 50 years time? But who's largely to blame for this 2016 is the worst year ever narrative? You guessed it, the cancerous polyp on the butt of humanity known as BuzzFeed. 24 tweets that perfectly sum up how shitty 2016 has been so far. It wasn't just you, Chipotle also had a terrible year. 2016 was quite a year. These are the gifts that got us through it. Guys, it's official, 2016 is actually the worst year. <sighs> no, BuzzFeed. Trump's election and Princess Leia dying doesn't compete with global catastrophes, genocide and plague. Maybe if you'd been living in Aleppo, in the middle of a civil war for the past 12 months, you could justifiably claim that 2016 was the worst year ever. Sitting in your comfy air-conditioned home on your iPad, reading a BuzzFeed listicle while tutting about Donald Trump, I don't think so. Oh yeah, and I would argue that when it comes to ranking the absolute worst people of 2016, the Orlando nightclub mass murdering terrorist Omar Mateen is somewhat more worthy of that title than people who you disagree with on the internet. The fact is that too many people care more about celebrities than their own family members. How many of you were more upset over Prince and David Bowie dying than your own grandmother dying. We've been completely disconnected from the people in our immediate life. The ones who should matter most. We've been atomized. No, dickhead. It's the worst year ever because Trump won. Right, so 100 plus families in Nice and Berlin had their loved ones crushed to death by crazed jihadists driving trucks and you're still whining about Trump. Your team didn't win an election. Get over it! You're still whining about your parents getting you the wrong coloured iPhone for Christmas. Show some gratitude. Your living standard is the highest in human history. You've never had it better. And what about all the good stuff that happened in 2016? We made massive strides in curing Alzheimer's and cancer. Global crime figures continue to come down. Child mortality rates continue to come down. Tiger numbers are recovering. Panda numbers are recovering. <laughs> 
Compared to our ancestors, life in 2016 was pretty damn good.